Okay, very good. Uh, thanks a lot. And thanks to Gabriel and the organizers for inviting me. It's hard to speak after and before some of the best economists in Europe. I'll try to do my best. But the problem is that by shuffling the order of the presentation, um, Gabriel has uh, prevented me from my best joke that I was the last obstacle between you and dinner. But uh, I said it anyway, so uh, I can move on. Um, <laughs> So what I want to do uh, with you is uh, to move, if you want, to the, the other side, the flip side of the coin. Instead of looking at the cost of protectionism, I want to look once more at the benefit of trade. Uh, I mean, in, uh, in Europe and at the Commission and in Brussels, it might, might be obvious to think that trade is beneficial. Uh, but uh, when we go down to, to policymakers at, uh, at, at national, at, at local levels, uh, that is much harder to, is a, mess, is a message that is much harder to, to pass on, right? Um, so from the, uh, from the point of view of, of economists, uh, trade and the benefits of free trade are one of the uh, least contentious issues in, uh, in, in, in economics, but uh, uh, cost associated with the reallocation of resources across sectors and firms, as uh, Hilke has already mentioned in her presentation, are often overlooked, or in a sense, uh, we tend to take for granted that uh, f uh, workers will be able to move across sectors or across firms almost seamlessly. And this is clearly not the case. And policymakers and, and the public are uh, very often concerned with the impact that trade may have on firms and workers. And these concerns uh, tend to be magnified uh, when uh, we trade and we discuss um, trade, trade policy issues uh, relative to countries with much lower level of wages or much different levels of uh, worker protections, for instance, right? And so this is clearly the case of China, which has become a, a matter of big uh, discussion in the US, but also in, in, in Europe, or at least in some European countries, maybe. Uh, now, I don't have to tell you that, that since its uh, entry into WTO, China has uh, become a very big player in world trade. Here you see some numbers, uh, but uh, for the sake of time, I'd rather uh, skip this and, and move on. Uh, so what are basically the bottom line, the effects of trade? Uh, first and foremost, trade alters prices, and so it triggers specialization, right? So countries would normally specialize in what they do better, uh, and all countries would benefit, right? We, we teach students that uh, trade is not a zero-sum game, but uh, the main benefit is that it can increase the size of the pie uh, that people can, can share. Of course, there are distributional issues that need to be taken into account. So what is the uh, charm, if you want, the, of uh, why is protectionism sexy with, with policymakers, or with some policymakers at least? Uh, the idea is to shield domestic firms from the effects of uh, globalization, of import competition. As, again, as it was mentioned in the in the previous presentation, uh, the, effect is, uh, the, the effect of trade will be that uh, some sectors and some firms will expand and some other sectors and some other firms will shrink, and so we shed labor. In the case of China, import competing sectors in Europe uh, include, and, and in the US of course, include many traditional manufacturing uh, industries like shoes, textile, apparels, uh, white goods, and so on and so forth, right? Uh, especially consumer products in, in general. Um, I think there are at least three reasons uh, why protectionism may not work as intended, and some of them uh, as hopefully, you know, fortunately, already been mentioned, so I can be quick on this. Uh, first of all, countries, foreign countries are likely to retaliate. In the panel this morning, I think Andrea Montanino showed this timeline of uh, policy measures and retaliatory measures, right? Uh, and so protectionism can backfire, uh, preventing exporters, uh, domestic exporters, uh, from reaping the benefits of integrated markets, right? One of the uh, famous examples was uh, Harley Davidson that basically told um, the, the, the Trump administration that was going to relocate some of his production from uh, the US to Europe 
uh, because of the retaliatory tariffs imposed by um, the, the EU on, uh, I mean, after uh, the steel tariffs, right? So uh, in, in that sense, uh, protectionism can backfire. Uh, the emergence of global value chains, which has been uh, mentioned and, and discussed uh, before, implies that firms need to import to be able to export, to be able to compete in international markets, right? And again, it was mentioned uh, earlier today that trading intermediaries today already account for around two-thirds of global trade, which means that basically goods do, are not produced in a single location and then shipped uh, somewhere else, but uh, parts and components uh, cross borders several times before being assembled and uh, sold uh, to, a single, uh, to, to, a, to a final destination, right? So, so a, a single tariff barrier imposed in different countries then uh, can be magnified and will eventually harm consumers and also, and also firms. So domestic firms that are well integrated in global value chains can be harmed by uh, protectionist measures uh, or any uh, trade barriers put, uh, put in place by their own government with the aim of protecting them. Right? And then uh, there is a strong within sector heterogeneity Again, this is, has been uh, mentioned before. Trade liberalization does not affect all firms and their workers in the same way. Some firms thrive under free trade. Uh, they create jobs, they innovate, they generate growth, and all these positive effects uh, will be hampered by uh, protectionism, by any form of protectionism. I'm not uh, just mentioning uh, tariff, as, as Simon has mentioned, there are many other hidden protectionist measures. But I am guilty here of thinking in terms of uh, import barriers and not looking at export subsidies or this sort of, uh, this sort of measures. Right? So what is the impact of trade on firms and, uh, and workers? Um, well, the, there, is a, there is a long, there is a large evidence uh, by now, that uh, to escape competition from low-wage countries and from China especially, firms need to upgrade, need to become better, need to innovate to improve the quality of their products, and in so doing, they improve their productivity, they can grow, and they create uh, new jobs. Uh, there are many studies that show that ICT adoption, innovation, patenting, trademarking, uh, all these type of activities shield firms from the negative effect of competitions. Um, and again, there is a lot of evidence showing that uh, firms that do upgrade and they do invest um, experience productivity and employment growth. Uh, this graph uh, shows, basic, compares basically uh, European firms and it distinguishes between uh, sectors that are uh, where uh, China import competition is low and firms where China import competition is high, right? And then it distinguishes between uh, ICT adoption, so uh, basically groups firms in terms of how much they have invested in information technology, right? Which is, if you want, a proxy to see the innovative effort of firms, right? And the bottom line is that uh, High-tech firms uh, do not really suffer from Chinese competition, right? But firms uh, with low uh, technology, if you want, um, that are very much open, very much um, subject to import competition, they do suffer much more than firms that are shielded from, um, from, from competition. Now, the problem is that uh, at least as, uh, as I see it, that um, governments often tend to focus on those firms and, and are, in a sense, focusing on protecting uh, firms from, the, uh, from free trade and from competition, uh, and they not often enough recognize that uh, free trade opens up new opportunities. And rather than protecting firms, uh, maybe policymakers should focus on making firms capable of uh, reaping the benefits of, of, free, uh, of free trade. So 
The bottom line is that import competition provides a powerful incentive to innovate, reduce inefficiencies, upgrade, and this has positive feedbacks on the entire economy. But of course, not all firms are ready uh, to do this, and this is where policy intervention should focus, in my opinion. Um, clearly, there is also a, 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 a workers' side, and, and what can we say about the effect of trade on, on workers? Um, there is little evidence uh, in the economic literature that international trade per se has a strong negative effect on jobs and wages. One possible explanation is that uh, trade triggers a polarization of the labor market so that there are some losers and some winners Overall, the effect sort of washes out, and we don't see a strong, uh, a strong aggregate effect. Indeed, we know by now that the cost of adjustment tend to fall uh, disproportionately on low-wage workers, low-skill workers, uh, whereas high-skill workers gain. And it is especially so when we incorporate into the picture the role of global value chains. So global value chains magnify this effect but can make uh, high-skilled workers uh, even better off. Um, now, to interpret all these phenomena in the remaining five minutes, sort of, four minutes, three and a half, two, okay, um, I try to uh, push for an interpretation. I, I, I suggest looking at the evolution of market power, and again, uh, this links, uh, I think, nicely uh, with the, one of the last slides in the previous presentation. Now I would like to push this button. Can I? Okay, very good. I spent most of my Sunday night trying to put that button in the in the slide, so I'm very proud I can use it. Um, so in, uh, 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 there is a mounting evidence, uh, uh, a mounting empirical work uh, showing that uh, market power is on the rise. Uh, and this is true in, in Europe, it's true in North America. This is work done by uh, Janne Kaut and uh, Jan de Locker. Um, and if we uh, go into the European countries, then most of the countries uh, experience or, or feature the same uh, kind of behavior, right? Um, this is uh, markups, so it's price cost margins, and they are on the rise uh, almost everywhere, right? Uh, uh, in, in, in their papers, uh, Ekaut and de Locker show that the phenomenon has important macroeconomic implications. So if you want, why do we care about the rise of market power? Well, we should care because uh, it has implication in terms of uh, the labor share of income. Uh, it has an implication in terms of uh, low skill wages and therefore the polarization of the labor market and, in, and, and, and wage inequality. Um, it has implications in terms of uh, labor mobility, which go down, mobility in terms of geography, and also mobility across firms and across jobs. Uh, and it also explains part of the slowdown in output and productivity growth. So these problems are the problems that affect several European countries. And I think that they fuel, they contribute at least, fueling uh, populist and nationalistic uh, sentiments, right? Uh, I mean, this is at least uh, my feeling from Italy. Uh, now, how does all this relate to trade? Now, trade liberalization increases competition in principle, so it should work against market power, right? Uh, and we know that the China shock, so China accession to the, the uh, WTO and its increasing role in world <coughs> trade has pushed down prices and markups in several markets especially consumer goods, right? If we abstract, if we exclude energy and raw materials whose prices have been pushed up by, uh, by, by China, in, in many other markets, prices have uh, gone down. But then because trade also induces the reallocation of resources toward the best firms, then it can increase their market power, the market power of the winners of globalization, right? Now here there is uh, two, I think, two different effects. Uh, there is an effect on goods market, on, on, on final products, and international competition, so international trade, will keep downward pressure on prices and markups, and so will keep market power in check, by and large. 
But uh, because labor markets tend to be more fragmented uh, and more local, and because of the size of these firms that become bigger, uh, because they can profit from international trade, then those firms can acquire substantial monopsony power in labor market. So uh, market power vis-a-vis -vis their workers, right? And this can have important negative effects in terms of wage inequality, employment, and labor mobility. Indeed, there is some evidence from the US from the, for, that, for the moment uh, suggesting that exposure to import from China <coughs> leads to more con concentrated labor markets, and this tends to push down wages, especially for the low-skill workers. Uh, now, the problem, though, is not trade per se. It's labor market concentration. And so the solution is not to reverse globalization and to raise protectionist measure, but is rather to try to limit the excessive buildup of market power, so enjoying basically uh, uh, the benefit of uh, free trade without uh, or limiting at least uh, the cost. Now, I think that this is an area of, uh, where more research is needed uh, in order to understand the interplay between trade and competition. So if any of you want, want to finance this kind of research, I'm ready to accept cash, uh, bank transfers, or checks at the end of the conference. Um, but now let me conclude. Um, so protectionism may harm domestic firms, domestic firms that rely on imported inputs uh, and those that are integrated in global value chains. Uh, international trade creates new opportunities, but of course not all firms are ready to uh, grasp them. Only the most innovative firms or the best firms, uh, to use a catch-all uh, term, uh, will, uh, will, will, will benefit. And globalization exacerbates selection effects. Right? There, is, there are higher rewards because there is a, there is a, a larger market uh, for the best firms and for the best workers, the most uh, skilled workers, uh, and there is less room uh, for uh, bad players, for, for, for lousy uh, firms and for lousy workers. Okay, so what do we do? Uh, well, I think we should invest uh, in human capital and skills uh, because they are increasingly important for both firms and, and, and workers to be able to compete in international markets. Uh, we should work, well, governments should work to ease the transition of workers uh, between firms and sectors. Again, this is something that economists take for granted, but we know that there are several frictions. And then we should, uh, I mean, more emphasis should be put on monitoring the evolution of market power, especially in uh, local labor markets to limit distortions. And that's it. Okay, thank you, Stefano. Um, two questions. So thanks, Stefano. If I were Jeremy Corbyn and I were listening to your presentation, I would say actually the policy recommendations to redress the excess labor Lexus, excess corporate power in the labor market are stronger trade unions, higher minimum wages, and let's get rid of wage subsidies which we're implementing through national welfare systems. Why would you tell Jeremy that he was wrong? <laughs> I, I think I would not even start. Uh, I mean, there are, there are several distortions. Shall, I, shall we pick up other questions, uh, Gabriel? Uh, Yes, if there is one. If there is any. Uh, oh, okay. Um, ah, here's one. Thank you. So uh, Trump was right about Ohio. About? Ohio with the Rust Belt. I mean, uh, okay. There is maybe another question down there. Herr Welfens, wollen Sie noch eine kurze Frage? Dann müssen wir. Okay, I was um, I was just just wondering whether. Your picture maybe again is not ignoring some of the, for instance, FDI aspect and, so, and also of the financial globalization effects. There is a paper by our IMF colleagues, if I remember correctly, who were arguing that financial globalization, so with very low real interest rates, and this is wonderful if you want to get a loan and you have wealth or any collateral 
or if you are a skilled worker and you have a decent income. So the unskilled workers cannot benefit from that type of globalization. And the second point is there is this paper by our Swiss colleague Reto Fermi. He basically shows, uh, based on microdata from a Swiss uh, tax office and so on, he shows that the strongest increase for the top 1% in Switzerland's income is for those who get income from foreign sources, so from abroad. Mm -hmm. And the more we have this foreign direct investment, and China, of course, pushes us in various ways to do this because they invade our kind of low and medium technology, and then we have to jump to the more high tech, and then in high tech you have more foreign direct investment and so on. So, so this is an additional dimension I think you want to take into account. Yeah, uh, I mean, all the comments are very uh, well taken. Uh, yeah, Ohio is clearly a, a problem. I mean, we know from, uh, from uh, ever that uh, some uh, firms, some sectors, some regions suffer. And, uh, but the idea is not to um, limit trade, it's to, uh, to help them adjust, right? And that's the, the, the issue. And I think it touches upon the first question as well. Uh, the problem is not to create, more, to put more sand in the wheels, but is to uh, help those who are left out or lose from globalization to, to adapt and to adjust, to have a, a larger share of firms uh, and workers can, that can uh, thrive, that can, that can benefit and take advantage of the, of the opportunities. Uh, in financial globalization is a big issue, and I think we, we haven't been touching, we're talking about, about this. Uh, I, I mean, I'm not referring here, when I say that uh, high skill uh, workers benefit, I'm not thinking of uh, financial professionals or, I mean, the big CEOs who will take home uh, zillions of, of dollars. Um, it's it, clearly that that's a problem, but it's, I don't think we have the time to start discussing uh, this. Still, if in, in the smaller scale, of uh, the heterogeneity that we have been discussing, uh, there, is, there is clearly that some workers benefit and, and some lose, and the gap is, is widening. We need to acknowledge this and to tackle uh, this without saying that we should simply stop all flows because they are uh, costing s some jobs or, or some wages to some specific workers.